Good afternoon. I hope you all can hear me. Um, my name is Billy Kelly and you're very welcome to this, the fourth of five webinars this week, which QQI, in association with the National Academic Integrity Network, is hosting on the topic of artificial intelligence and its impact on higher education. Uh, the National Academic Integrity Network, which I'm chair, is a national peer driven network of staff members from Irish higher education institutions, student representatives and higher education representative agencies. It comprises over 100 members, uh, including members from 26 higher education institutions, all the publicly funded HEIs and the larger private colleges, students from individual students union and the Union of Students in Ireland, and student professional support groups, including librarians, counsellors, finally QQI executive members. QQI facilitates and supports the activities of the network. Nonetheless, the network is independent of QQI. Today's webinar is a panel discussion with colleagues from the National Academic Integrity Network who will give us their thoughts on how the growth and accessibility of artificial intelligence uh, and, uh, will, may shape higher education. And the panel members are Dr. Barry Sher from Atlantic Technological University, Sligo, Dr. Yvonne Kavanagh from Southeast Technological University in Carlo, Greg O'Brien from Griffith College in Dublin, and Brian O'Mahony from Southeast Technological University, Waterford, who provides an important student voice on AI, and Dr. Monica Ward from Dublin City University. With that, I'm going to hand over to Perry, who's the convener of today's webinar. Perry, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Billy. Um, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. And it's great to have this opportunity to bring together our colleagues to discuss some of the implications of um, artificial intelligence in higher education. Uh, yes, recently, Sam Altman, who was the um, CEO of, Chat, of OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, uh, referred to the development of artificial intelligence and chat GPT in general as something at a level far beyond anything that we're prepared for. Now, I think he was talking about artificial intelligence in general and how it was going to impact on society, but he may well have been talking about higher education. And you, if you want to see the full uh, interview that um, he carried out with Lex Lippmann, you can see it on YouTube, uh, all two and a half hours of it. Indeed, just yesterday, hundreds of artificial intelligence researchers, ethicists and tech leaders called for a pause on the development of ChatGPT, especially the development of GPT-5, to give some time for people in the broader society to consider the implications of this new technology and to give a six month to delay to draw a breath, really, and to address some of the regulatory issues. And we'll see how that uh, particular initiative turns out. Uh, my name, as Billy said, is Dr. Perry Sher. I'm the head of student success at Atlantic Technological University in Sligo on the northwest coast of Ireland. And like many people, I've become interested in AI and higher education over the last year or so. Um, my background, research background is in two areas. One is social robotics and one is academic integrity. So they sort of came together uh, in the area of AI. And I suppose last year I started playing around and like many people with GPT-3 and didn't think that it was a much, much of an imminent threat. I thought it was interesting. I thought it was uh, fascinating, really, and had all sorts of potential. But I didn't think it was going to have any immediate impact. And indeed, I went to a big um, assessment in higher education conference in Manchester last summer. And some of you may have also been at the AHE conference. And in fact, there was only one paper uh, by Stephen Gow from York University looking at the impact of artificial intelligence in assessment. So you could say that across the higher education community, even um, last summer, it wasn't really an issue of general concern. Uh, all, of course, has changed drastically with the launch of ChatGPT in late November uh, last year. And of course, the, the attraction of the chatbot format uh, to, to the accessibility of this technology. Uh, I was quoted in the Irish Times here in Ireland last Saturday as saying that a bomb had landed on higher education. And I suppose if to use that metaphor, it's not a, a bomb that wipes everything out very quickly, but it's certainly a bomb that is having reverberations, I think, across the higher education sector. And 
especially reverberations for people whose everyday work is managing uh, all the activities in higher education. So there's a lot of been a, been a lot of conceptual discussion around uh, chat GPT, a lot of philosophical discussion even, uh, and a lot of talk about re revising assessment and so on, but not so much consideration maybe to just the everyday practical issues of what it's going to mean for those of us who work in higher education. So I think it's a great opportunity today to, to take four members from across the, the name network in higher education with different roles. So we have an assistant registrar, we have a student representative, we have an educational technology developer, and we have a head of teaching and learning. So four diverse roles, all of whom are going to have to address the impact of this new technology as it indeed reverberates through their own higher education institutions and the sector as a whole, both in Ireland and globally. And I suppose just to say at this stage, it's obviously very early days in, in our response. And what people are going to say is inevitably going to be tentative. It's going to be temporary. It may not even be the official position of their own higher education institution because we're all grappling with this. So when people are disseminating this recording or you know what people are saying in this webinar, just to keep that in mind, these aren't official statements of position. They're people's opinions from where they are particularly sitting. And the format, uh, as Billy suggested, is we'll have the, the four panel members will each talk for five minutes on uh, some of the aspects of how they're responding to AI in their own institutions. And then we've left, uh, I think, a fairly generous 20 minutes for questions and answers because we're really interested in viewpoints from across Ireland and from across the world as to how this is indeed reverberating across higher education institutions. And then if we have um, 10 minutes left at the end, uh, I'll just do a quick wrap up and maybe some of the key points. So if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat during the discussion and we'll uh, we'll have up the four speakers first and then we'll come to the questions and answers. Uh, if your question is for a particular individual, just say so. Otherwise, uh, I'll just uh, tr try to direct it to who I think might be the best person to, to answer and we'll obviously we'll spread it around amongst the participants. So without further ado, uh, I think it's very important that we hear uh, the voice of the probably the key st stakeholders in all of this, uh, this disruption, which is our students. So uh, I'd like to introduce Brian O'Mahony and he will introduce uh, or talk about his role and so on. So Brian, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Brian O'Mahony. I am currently the Vice President for Education and Deputy President in SETU Student Union in Waterford. So today I'm going to talk from a kind of a student perspective, how it's on the ground, how it's looking. So with the AI revolution comes so many challenges, I think, but at the same time with those challenges are opportunities. While in the world of academia, we can see some people are worried and afraid of the AI that's coming up, but we have an opportunity here like none other before. We have the chance to try and evolve college. We've become so kind of stagnated in our approach and the way we're kind of doing things, with this kind of change in the field, it's kind of forcing the hands now to actually look at real change in the system. So we can look at people that are running to closed book exams, but we also have lecturers that are trying to push inclusivity of it within their curriculum. We have lecturers that are including it within their coursework, including it on pieces of their assignments with a thesis. The opportunities there are endless. We have an interesting kind of scenario where we have some students that know exactly what ChatGBT is, love it and have been exploring it completely. And then we have students that have no clue what it is. Trying to get that kind of equity across next year is going to kind of be very important to make sure that there's equality across the line with it. Um, so like for next steps, like students aren't going to really use this as a platform to cheat. Students don't cheat because it's easy. They cheat because they feel like they have no other options. And we have a load of kind of failures within our education system because of that. It kind of comes down to stress that we have with, for, with the students. The landscape we have within the education system at the moment doesn't really endorse critical thinking. It kind of really kind of pushes the effect of regurgitation, rote learning. It's a case of trying to get your assignment done, your assessment done for the end of year for the module, get it done, get into the next semester. We don't look at turn it in as the percentage on turn it in as kind of a, a mark of what we need to stay away from. We see it as a target to see how close we can get to that in order to pass. We need to try and bring back critical thinking within our curriculum. The college was made to be a place of learning, development and debate, way to find progress through our ed educational environment. 
it's not really that anymore. We're pushing to get the paper and get out the door to get into the working world now. And I, I don't think that's what we should be endorsing. Um, it's I find some colleges forget sometimes, uh, as some people have said, that students are the biggest stakeholders. Curriculum and assessment has to be co-designed and fit for purpose with students in mind. If students aren't part of the conversation, it's not for students. When lecturers are so long out of education, they forget kind of what it was like to be in education. So having students on the platform in the conversation means that it's a co-designed approach fit for all. Um, nowadays, it, it, the college isn't reflective of the working world anymore. It's a case of it's, it's just not the same. Knowledge can now be found at our fingertips where it wasn't before. And if education, the way the process was done is the same as some people's parents were doing it and the world around us is evolving and education isn't evolving, we're at a standstill. We're kind of dead in the water. The college format needs to change. We need to kind of reflect the, how the working world is changing and bring that back because college ultimately is preparing you for the working world. We need to kind of relook of how we change that. We need to try and adapt, adopt uh, AI and AI usage into our curriculum because that is what's going to be used in the working world now. It's not going away. There's no way to catch up and trying to get um, processes to detect it. It's not going to happen. We're developing too fast and it's never going to happen. We need to kind of look at more kind of robust uh, feedback policies. If we have constant check in, there's no need to be worried about the students cheating if you're part of the process of them developing their assignments. We also, when we're talking about assignments, we need to look at kind of the realities of assessment nowadays. In a cost of living crisis that we have at the moment, we can't expect students to attend every class, attend all these exams on the days because we're, students are no longer part time workers. They're full time workers, some with couple, not just one job. I've heard of students with up to three jobs just trying to survive out here at the moment. If we don't develop and take that in mind and keep a stagnant kind of approach, Again, we're, we're not fit for students then. We're, we're just trying to stick to what the line is, what's traditional and not adapt to the world as it's changing around us. Uh, that's why we need more hybrid learning, record lectures and stuff like that will help compromise that. We need to adapt with the technology that we have and put it into the assessments that we have in the college that we have. So if I was just to give a kind of key message just to kind of top this all off, artificial intelligence isn't something to be feared, but to be excited for. The opportunities with this is endless. While it will bring a completely unbalanced stage of where we're at for the moment, it's 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 possibilities are endless. We can do so much with it. If we can make an equity across learning for all and make it fair for all. I would say embrace it and utilize the AI and the, the scare tactic that it's bringing as an assessment reform and curriculum redesign fit for students for all. Thank you. Thanks very much, Brian. I think you've uh, thrown down a very large number of challenges there to the higher education community and I'm sure we'll pursue some of those lines uh, and it's really good to hear the, the position of students and and that remarkable um, fact I suppose you said that so many students are now involved in full-time work and often with a number of jobs and that's going to shape how we respond I think in many ways. So obviously the technology is a big challenge for accreditation and the value of the qualifications that we give out in higher education and it's the registrars across the world who who keep keep the barriers and keep the boundaries around the the integrity of those qualifications and now i'm going to ask yvonne Kavanagh, who's assistant registrar registrar at um, southeast technological university to to talk to us Thanks, Perry. Um, my name is Yvonne Kavna, and I am the Assistant Registrar in the Southeast Technological University, as you said, in the Carlo campus. And yes, uh, my remit is very much around registrar jobs, shall we say, and quality maintenance and maintenance of our degrees. So if we just go through the key challenges that I face or that we face in our role, um, these basically are central around, first of all, ensuring that all academic staff are aware of generative AI and then aware of the implications that it has on them and aware that how it will impact their assessments and their protocols and their regime and then to ensure confidence in the awards the standards that we have and in the awards that we actually give out to people so that's our primary objective is looking at get making sure that we look at the um the actual standards that we have and how we actually engage with them. Um, also in terms of research integrity, we also have to look at publications and how the landscape here is developing and ensure that our principles and our policies and procedures are fit for purpose and reactive. 
But at the same time, of course, we want policies that last for a while and we don't want to be too reactive. So the key changes then that we've already implemented, um, we, as we know, are in the most innovative, the most literally impactful jobs there are in relation to education. We are all people who try things out. So naturally, our people were the first people on board to test out ChatGPT, find its limitations, find what it can do, find out how it can be used. And we're really excited about playing with it and experimenting with it and with DALI and all of the other various methodologies that are out there and all of the other AI that's out there. And this has led to guidance, therefore, from our Teaching and Learning Centre, which notes for our staff on what to look out for and how to recognise um, ChatGPT is in use or how to recognise some of its limitations and how to actually look at what's happening. And because of that, this was our first response in January. As you said, you know, the way we're, we're out the gate, we're reacting to this and we're coming up with something that stu the students and staff can actually engage with. Um, looking at it then more deeply, of course, quickly Academic Council came on board and asked for specific SETU guidance on generative AI and therefore a subgroup and task force was essentially set up to produce guidance for all staff and students. And as this landscape is continuously changing every single day, this is an updated and live document, living document where we get feedback and input at all stages all the time. So the key things that we're looking at to do in next semester and that we're working on, of course, we're very lucky in SETU, we're working on our academic integrity policy at the minute. And although though it already includes options such as oral presentations to be asked for for any reason, it will specifically mention generative AI and we are awaiting the guidance on what exactly we use it for and how we use it for. And we will actually have that in our policies. A lot of staff as Brian automatically said there and you talked about very nicely about some of the innovative assessment methods and practices that we are developing. And we now we have to look at how we develop those across more traditional assessment regimes. And this will be a focus for us as well. Um, Perry asked us to you know, look into the looking glass and say, what do we think the landscape will be in about two years time? Well, I skipped forward 10 years and uh, Bar the letter this morning from all the uh, experts in the area of AI, and uh, we'll see how that goes. In 10 years time, I could see that um, AI would be an educational tool where Alexa will be the home tutor for children aided by open AI. And we will be in the ethics landscape where trust, bias, truth, um, reliability of information would be the main topics that we would discuss at a session like this. And I suppose the key message we are in a technological world and we have to learn to harness and harvest this technology. That's vital for our survival and for the way we look at the world in future. In terms of tertiary education, we have to reiterate our core mission regarding the development of critical thinking and synthesis focus mindsets, which question absolutely everything. And I agree with Brian there. We're right on the same page with critical thinking skills, our synthesis and those mindsets. I mean, that's what we're doing because information is at our hand. But what do we do with that information? How do we interrogate it? And this is where we have to look at what we are actually doing at a local national level, again, to maintain that um, emphasis on our awards and how we ensure that there's public confidence in what we do in tertiary education. Thanks, Perry. Thanks very much, Yvonne, and uh, for that perspective uh, from, from, I suppose, trying to coordinate it, coordinate, coordinate an institutional response. Apologies there. Uh, coordinate an institutional response to, to this challenge. Um, just to say, uh, people, uh, feel free to put your questions and comments into the chat. There's already been some quite um, supportive uh, responses to what Brian was having to, was saying earlier on, I think, uh, and we'll come to those questions uh, with plenty of time later on. So our next speaker then is an educational technologist, uh, Greg O'Brien from uh, Griffith College in Dublin, and I'm going to ask him to talk about the challenges that he sees that the AI revolution is going to create for his work in Griffith. Thanks, Perry. Thanks so much to Yvonne and thanks to Brian. Um, I've been lucky enough to have seen 
Brian uh, talk in this month twice and his talks both times really uh, deeply um, changed my, my mind, changed my mind completely and reminded me of what we should be doing as educators. Um, I'm Greg O'Brien. I've been a learning technologist at Griffiths for about five years, and this role is really to optimize uh, teaching and learning with technology. And our visibility as learning technologists came to the foreground at institutions in the old pandemic days. And it's fortunate in a way because I'm well positioned as I deal with and intersect all faculties and schools in our three campuses. And guidance on this new era was required of our team in late 2022 as we began to synthesize and um, form meaning around what generative AI uh, means for us. And we started to rapidly research and use the tech ourselves. And the big questions, of course, uh, as many of us are grappling with, are how do we communicate the changes to our learners and our staff? And what are the consequences anyway of the change? Uh, what are they going to be um, to work all of those big questions out, which we're still uh, working out at, on a daily basis? So as a group, small group of us began to practice with the tools over the holidays, uh, late 2022, and re-examined the meaning of academic integrity against the backdrop of the new era, if you like. And so began the start of an intensely busy period for all of us, as I'm sure you can recognize, agree with. So in January, we started a wide and extensive dialogue with staff. So I introduced a concise history of AI up to and including ChatGPT, and we explored use cases and limitations. And I outlined some of the challenges and the utter importance of collaborative efforts across the sector. We can't do this alone. And laid out the landscape for what at the time, the beginning of the year, very polarized views globally on adoption or banning or promotion of uh, generative AI. And then some of the new, if you like, rock stars of the of, of this area, uh, we, we, we turned to them, expert scientists and academics such as Gary Marcus, uh, Sarah Elaine Eaton and Anna Mills, who recently gave a talk in uh, in Ireland. So we, we recognize the need for sustained dialogues with learners, staff, faculties, while um, we wanted to adopt AI use, uh, to discuss its use with students and, and staff. But we flagged rapid developments in detection uh, tech, which we have serious concerns uh, about. Um, we proposed achieving adjust, uh, we proposed uh, achievable adjustments to uh, learning and, and assessments, which uh, can be challenging to think about. We then issued guidance on the use of AI for learners and staff along um, what we thought were clear guidelines and, and clear lines uh, that we wanted generative AI to be used and to engage in the conversation between staff and students uh, while avoiding detection software at this stage, at least while we're reviewing it in the sector and in terms of the dangers it presents in terms of accuracy and personal image information protection, uh, for example. And we wanted to indicate that while well, the use of uh, generative AI needs to be flagged as um, to lear learners need to flag basically that they had used it or, or not used it and uh, alluding to that sort of um, open um, communication between faculty and, and learners. So we subsequently workshopped with staff to inform and enable them to talk about and devise new assessment strategies while keeping them informed daily about developments via our new AI information hub. And we also then had uh, interactive academic writing workshops with hundreds of students to develop their writing skills and confidence in writing and to inform them of the opportunities and challenges and dangers of AI while flagging the traditional pitfalls of contract cheating services and all of those um, dangers therein. So. Before I finish then, it's very, very difficult to see the future, isn't it? Um, so I, I, I'm, uh, in case I'm wrong, apart from anything else, um, but over the next 24 months, perhaps we need to review the opportunities of things like reflective activity practices and assessment where possible, and other old reliable qualities in teaching, like what's a truly engaging class and what does it look like? And as Brian was talking about, um, I don't mean to jump onto your coattails, Brian, but what are the opportunities for 
uh, the principles of multiple means of representation, multiple means of expression for those of us who are neurodiverse. There's a massive opportunity to transform our support for, for learners. So as I see it, I would urge all of us to start using if we haven't. We have to understand it. We have to gain air miles, if you like, and gain some kind of literacy and competency as learners and educators. So we really need standalone um, AI literacy modules or embedded in traditional digital skills courses um, where we can really start to discover what we can achieve with this technology. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thanks very much, Greg. Yeah, again, um, a lot of things to consider, a lot of a lot of challenges for the higher education sector. And I think you know you really drew out the importance of collaboration, of dialogue, of drawing on the skills and expertise of you know people who've been looking into the, the areas of both artificial intelligence and academic integrity, the two AIs uh, over the over the years, and some of the um, the insights and wisdom that they have developed and. I think what what we've been seeing is the the emergence of a real global network around these this topic, uh, and maybe in some ways which we haven't seen before in the the whole area of teaching and learning. Um, but I may be mistaken in that, so I'm going to uh, hand over now to to Monica Ward, who's the um, Dean of Teaching and Learning at Dublin City University, uh, to offer us her perspective on where things are going, especially from a teaching and learning point of view. So, Monica, the floor is yours. Great, thanks very much. So, you've stolen my first line, so that's okay. And apologies for the light. The sun is doing something funny here. Um, so, the the key challenges are kind of somewhat similar to Yvonne. Um, you know, it's is advising colleagues. So, this this is. You know, happening as you know, people say we're kind of building a new aircraft as we're flying the aircraft, and it's you know we're only you know, maybe a paragraph ahead of the people that we're advising, so it's it's quite challenging. Um, we have to support people, um, because it's very easy to kind of say, oh, this is the end of life as we know it, and and maybe it is in some cases, but um, you know that there there's a solution to every problem. So you know, with the kind of collective, um group that we have here in Ireland and kind of tapping into our colleagues internationally, we, we will come up with the solutions. Um, so the, the key things that are happening already, um, and I think one thing that we want to avoid is for those who have done a continuous assessment up to now, the rush back to a closed book, individuated, time limited exams, like that, that's not accessing anything kind of we want. And we give out about our students coming in from the leaving cert being able to just regurgitate a whole lot of facts and not understand anything. And it's kind of mad if we're kind of saying, well, you know, well, we need to do it, but you shouldn't be doing it, you know. Um, somebody mentioned about the kind of the checkers. Again, we have to be really careful about them. I had a question from a colleague. Somebody ran something through a checker. They came up with 50 percent match. What does that mean? Um, you know, and the problem is that once something is generated, you know, the next time you put in the exact same question, it can generate something else. So there's not a copy out there of the original. And as Anna Mills pointed out, I mean, it can easily flag somebody's actual writing as potentially being generated by um, a Gen AI thing. So, you know, it's 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 very complicated. Um, I was talking to another colleague this morning who um, was in a, an institute where somebody um, has managed to write, a, write up their PhD remarkably quickly. Um, beating all previous records in the institution. So there's obviously kind of some some things there. I think we need to think of two different things. One is, you know, different dif disciplines will be affected in different ways. So if you're in a discipline that has always had, you know, an, you know, essay writing or reports as being a kind of a big component of the uh, assessment um, infrastructure, I think that could be problematic and you'll need to put in way stages and kind of monitor, you know, are, so are you interested in the process? Can the student go through the process or are you interested in the product? And I also depends on where you're starting at. So um, if I think of, for example, one of the modules that I used to deliver, um, I would use um, you know, weekly touch points with the students. I would have interactive orals, which are different than a normal oral exam. It's not a viva, you're examining the student here. It's in a real world scenario. Um, so there's maybe less tweaks required there, although obviously some, in case Perry jumps on me, obviously some, but whereas, you know, it's, it depends on kind of where you're starting in, in terms of your assessment. Um, two years from now, I mean, it's all very dizzy. I mean, I'm in, I'm from the 
a school of computing. I'm in from a computing background and I've heard about AI ooh, way back in my undergrad days. Well, thank you. Hi, Billy. Uh, Billy used to teach me many years ago. Um, and, you know, obviously, you know, on a daily basis, there's a, a deluge of information. The AI leader is saying kind of let's have a time out on this. I mean, I think it's like putting pushing a boulder up a hill. You know, it's out the genie's out of the box. Um, I think it'll, as Anne, uh, um, Yvonne referred to, I think it'll be more involved in learning. So it'll be very good for students who want kind of, they didn't understand what the lecture was saying. It'd be very good for kind of summaries. But we really have to, you know, it, it generates, it hallucinates, it makes up stuff at the moment. G, um, Chat GPT 3, 4 is a bit more reliable, but it's not gaining, it, it's only a language model. It's only generating the next word. It's not actually mining information. So we really need to educate people about that. Um, you know, some people have likened it to the use of the calculator. We weren't allowed to use a calculator, and now they're essential. Um, I kind of maybe liken it to, you know, when Google came out first and we said, no, no, you can't use Google. You have to go down to the library and kind of pull something off of the shelf and look at it. And I mean, you know, who who's going to, to do that now? Um, you know, this is already happening. And I think, you know, in my kind of Pollyanna, bright eyed and bushy tailed moment, I think it might be the thing that pushes people towards authentic assessment. Um, so um, Brian was talking about, you know, students, you know, ideally they come to university to learn and if the assessment is going to help them learn, they're going to do it. So I'm involved in a short course at the moment on um, education for sustainable development. And one of the pieces of work we had to do was, you know, prepare a plan for your university. And to me, that I mean, that's that's something I have to do anyway. So it made total sense for me to do it. And I wasn't going to get somebody else to do it. Um, and also it's local to my university, so it'd be very difficult for Yvonne to write it because she doesn't know do my scenario. So I think that kind of localised, personalised, authentic assessment um, is the way to go. Um, in terms of key messages, um, the so academics, you know, you, you go in and you teach science and you teach geography or whatever it is because you're really passionate about your subject. You know, content is king and that's what people like doing. They like talking about their, their, their subject matter. Um, dealing with kind of different ways of teaching or different ways of assessing is messy and, you know, it, it requires a lot of effort. So I would say to people that we need time, we need resources to, to do it. It's just as students kind of quickly adopt this, academics are going to have to have a mindset changed in terms of how they do assessment. Um, I know people may not be comfortable with the concept, but, you know, Carlos has said, you know, assessment drives learning. So the first thing the students will always ask you is, what's the assessment? How much is it worth? When is it due? Et cetera, et cetera. They want, oh, are we going to learn all these wonderful things, right? So if you think any academic in the room, if you think if you've done a course and you had to do some piece of assessment, you would be asking those questions as well. So it's good to kind of step into the student's shoes. Um, and in, uh, there, you know, in, I'm kind of involved in education from primary, secondary and, and third level. And it takes 15 years sometimes to make a change at primary school level, you know, to kind of agree on the curriculum. Blah, blah, blah. Um, so I think we're, we're going to be need to be more agile in uh, in the third level sector. But um, senior management and people in society and policymakers need to realise that it is going to take time. Um, you know, we we were unfortunate in the release of um, ChatGPT in November because it came out just before the kind of the Christmas break in, in DCU. Like we were marking and we were straight into the semester. So there wasn't the headspace to redesign. So I think we really need to kind of get some good lines and good like good guidelines in place for semester one, 23, 24. And I'll stop there. Sorry if I went over time, Perry. No, you're fine. Thanks very much. And thanks very much to our four contributors. And as Monica was saying, assessment is very important. So now here is your exam <laughs> for the next 20 minutes. And we've had lots of interesting questions in the in the chat and I'll try to get through um, as many as I can. And I'll start off with uh, Liam Murray, who asked a question early on. And I think this is interesting from the point of view of AI literacy, which uh, we're all saying is something that students need to develop, but what is it? So I suppose Liam is pointing to that, you know, when people talk about AI, they say that one of the things that it should be is explainable. And what does this mean? So here's an here's an interesting example of what does AI literacy mean? So I think Greg was mentioning AI literacy. Maybe, Greg, I'll hand that one over to you. When we say we're going to develop AI literacy among students, what are we talking about? 
I am specifically, thanks for, for that and, and thanks for the question. <laughs> I'm specifically talking about really um, turning a, a skills module like that the other way around, less um, the history of AI, what is uh, general artificial intelligence, et cetera, but starting with prompt engineering right now. You know, that's that's achievable right now very soon. And in fact, I hope to develop some something like that here, which maybe could be an open educational resource or, what, or whatever. But prompt engineering, what does all of that mean? There was a talk we were at recently um, where um, you might remind me who the speaker was from um, TU Dublin and um, said that these tools require not that much human input but maybe a lot of thinking afterwards for the, from the response, et cetera. Um, someone might remind me it was at the March, the, te uh, the 10th of March uh, meeting that we had. Robert. It was Robert Ross, wasn't yeah. it? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And no one had actually said that. We're, we're, there's not that much input, but what, what is the format of what we ask the generative AI? And there's a, there's a few rules around that, um, which I'm sure Perry can, has, has some uh, resources that you, you were intending to share later that address this. But starting with that sort of hands on, before we get to discussing what the output is in, in our classrooms, um, that kind of just the rules of prompting really is, is all I'm talking about as a starting point. And then we can fill up our, our skills courses with other um, other more maybe philosophical aspects of, of AI or where it's going into the future, because the AI that we have, I think, at the moment is a much debated in the scientific community in terms of the right way to go or not. Um, I would say, and I'd say there's there's a split in the scientific community about that. So, sorry, no, if I yeah. over answered there. No, great. Thanks very much, Greg. So it's a, it's going to be a new skill for for us all to learn prompt engineering, and um, there will be jobs in prompt engineering. There already are some very well paid ones, I believe. Uh, but it's certainly something we're all going to have to a new language we're going to have to to learn and fairly quickly. Um, a second question uh, from Orna Farrell. And um, hi there, Orna. And great to hear from you. Um, and this is, I might put this in Yvonne's direction because it sort of does link into what she was saying and and a further comment as well from um, Nicola Gaffney, um, which is the other side of it, I suppose. How do we, how does our guidance keep pace with the tools that have been released at the, and the, at the same time make it dynamic and flexible enough to teach with the, or to deal with the, the rapidly emerging landscape? So. I think if you could answer this question, you'll probably be, get a Nobel Prize, Ivana, Ivan. But you know, how do we deal? How do we deal with that real challenge of keeping up with and having the regulation at the same time? I think this is where we have to be very strategic in our policies and cover everything in a ver at a very strategic level, first of all. And then as we roll down, we go to the procedures. And at that stage, then we can address each particular area in uh, but all generative AI, I think, goes under the one umbrella, if you like, whether it's DALI or it's, you know, G chat GPT or BARD or any of the others. It's it's all in one umbrella network. So I think that's what we actually have to look at is how the use of those are impacted at a policy level. And then procedurally, then we can look at what we're going to do and how we're going to integrate at each particular time, because it is much easier within our systems to change our procedures, whereas our policies, as we know, take time as they go through the different iterations and as they go through academic council, governing body, and depending on our, on our actual governance system. But I think as well as that, the guidance, like the teaching and learning centres are the key there to get that guidance out really, really quickly on what's coming up next, what to look at and what to actually be, look out for. And I think that's where they come into their own and that that is their area, shall we say, for quick, fast guidance, which can change. And I think we all have to live with that fact that it can change. What we say today may not be what we we're going to work with in six months time because this is evolving this is um how would you say exciting times in education so this is where we're at and i think the work in nain for example as well the national academic integrity network and where we go there and how we actually work through working group four and working group five I co-chair working group four with Ashling Reese from RCSI and of course Ian McLaren, who's on the uh, call here as well, is chair of working group five. So it's how we actually work with that 
and we have that support. We're very lucky in Ireland. We have that network. We can actually work through the network to get a lot of this information out there and to work with the network to make sure that the guidance is out there for everybody and everybody's in the room and hearing it. Thanks. OK, thanks, Yvonne. So a lot a lot of responsibility for our teaching and learning centres, I suppose, to 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 do this. And it will be a, a real challenge because it's it's a rapidly developing area and might come back to back to the, the role of the teaching and learning centres in a minute. But I just give the next question over to Brian because um, it's noted. Um, let me see by Simon Walker that you know if if not already very soon these tools are all going to be part of the microsoft suite and other common tools and i suppose what's your view brian on what what should higher education institutions be providing to students how far should they go in providing um ai based tools i mean should it be absolutely everything that's out there or should there be some sort of um limiting i know in my own my own institution in atlantic technological university i went looking for the the chat side of Bing, for example, and I was told that that's not being installed by IT services. Um, so, you know, there's already a resistance there, maybe, and I had to go looking for it and get it, get it on my phone instead. So what do you think from a student point of view is the responsibility of higher education institutions in making access to these services? Yeah, a great question. Um, I, I think it's hard to it'll be hard for the support for all of them to be there because we're progressing so fast so you know so quickly new software is everyone's trying to catch up and different companies going it'll be hard for support for all kind of tools to be implemented within coursework um and then of course is it worth implementing some tools in the coursework is another thing whether the ai that the content that it provides is it actually something that can be relied on is it something that's going to be truly helpful um I suppose the the easiest way to answer it would be that it's up to kind of um, it'll be up to kind of trying the testing of the tools to see if they're work, if they're suitable for the coursework, suitable for the college, if there'll be any advantage or if there's something that's just better to be laid to the wayside that isn't actually going to be anything of benefit for students or the college itself. Yeah. Good, good answer. Yeah, and I think you know, and, and a lot of the ethical issues too around large language models. I mean, everything from the the environmental costs of the the electricity that's required to do the the teaching of these models through to the you know the wages paid to the people who do the do the the checking of the the content and so on, uh, and the the dominance of you know two or three very very large tech companies over higher education. I mean, we're already outsourcing so much of our activity to third parties. Uh, and, you know, are we going to even do that more with this? Um, next question maybe for, for Monica. Um, is it, and I think, you know, coming out of um, Yvonne's last answer was the role of teaching and learning centres and, and that whole infrastructure for supporting teaching and learning. And I suppose a lot of people have been saying that this is a great opportunity to bring in lots of the things that people have wanted for for many years, like more authentic assessment, more relationship based assessment and a lot of things that Brian talked about. So what would you see as the barriers to this having in the having happened in the past? I mean, why haven't we reached this nirvana already? And, you know, what would you see as the barriers now of, of changing teaching and learning in response to artificial intelligence? Um, I would say something that people in this call will understand, but people outside may not understand, is the pressure on academics to do brilliant teaching and learning, to be top class in their research and do their service activities as well. Um, you know, in, in some disciplines, they're, they're constantly updating their teaching materials as things move on. Um, and it's very hard to find the headspace to actually think, how am I going to change my assessment? Um, because, you know, it's like any adoption curve. There are some early adopters and say, great, this is an opportunity I can throw, like we did with COVID, like throw out that, that invigilated, time-limited, closed book exam. It doesn't make sense. I'm going to go with something much better. For others, it's, well, I want to see how others do it first. Um, and again, it's, it's um, you know, it, it's discipline specific. I mean, so Ian had said there in the chat, like, 
you know, what, what are we doing assessment for? What are we actually assessing? So, um, you know, I'd say that it, the challenge is, is multi-layered. So first of, you know, making sure that the people in the, the teaching and learning support centre actually themselves are upskilled in what's happening. It's hard, to, it's hard enough for us who are sort of allegedly knowing something in the space. You know, every day there's a new thing coming out. We have to read it. We have to read the three different viewpoints. We're looking at what's happening in Australia. They kind of tend to be ahead in some ways. What's happening in the States? What are the experts saying? What is the technology saying? So like we have to get up, up update ourselves first. Then we have to make sure the people in the teaching, you know, and learning support roles I know that. Then we have to figure out, you know, what is the institutional policy going to be? What is the approach? Um, then we have to try and, you know, figure out with the academics, how do we actually, you know, make it as, I mean, I think the role is to make it as easy for academics to do the right thing. Um, and I don't think we're going to be fully sorted by September 23, but I think we maybe will have more kind of guidelines in, in, in place for academics. So it's not going to happen overnight. The technology is going like this and we're going like this and some academics are going like this. Um, you know, so it's 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 not easy, but we can't just we can't just ignore it. We have to do the best we can with with what we have. Right. Thanks, Monica. It brings us back to your metaphor of, of trying to fix the plane while the while flying the plane, and there's there's people probably running up and down the aisles screaming, and then there's other people sitting in their back in the back row with their glass of wine, just sitting, yeah, <laughs> thinking someone's going to fix it. Everything will be fine, um, and who knows. <laughs> Uh, a very interesting question from Sue Hackett, and I'll throw this out to anybody, but in relation to Turnitin, and it could be any detection software, it's not specifically Turnitin perhaps, but they seem to have a monopoly on the market now, um, that a lot of higher education institutions in the UK and Australia are opting out of uh, turning on an AI detector because of the chaos that it will cause. And uh, I wonder what people's views on that. So if anyone wants to jump in on, on the, the notion that I presume because we will catch too many people uh, or detect too many people. I mean, is that something that we need to be thinking about here in Ireland and even having a, a national policy on or some sort of thought about whether we should use or not use these um, technologies, even if they work, which we don't know if they will, will or not? Greg, yeah. And oh, I think Monica got in ahead. ahead you go ahead, there. Greg. It's fine. <laughs> um, it's interesting because what we're what we're kind of looking at is, um, you know, the generative AI AI technology. That in itself isn't particularly, you know, peer reviewed. You know, itself, it's quite a closed world. How does what's what's going on inside there? And then we're looking at a detection tool which in itself has been rapidly developed, even though, of course, Turnitin have been probably working on this for a long time. And in the context of that, in January too, you had a plethora of detection tools emerging. And in late 2022, um, one of them being Zero GPT. Remember that amazing 22-year-old from Canada who developed that? So I'm, I'm, I'm personally cautious until like, we don't want any more chaos or disruption. Um, and the accuracy so far has been off, very, very off. And where is, you know, where is that data going anyway? We, we can't um, drop a student's work into a system that I, I, I just don't know where that data is going to go. So that, that would be my personal opinion on, on, on it. Yeah, and just to follow, yeah, I think Ian said it in the chat, you know, you know, maybe it's a flag to, you know, um, what's the phrase in the name guidelines beyond a co probable cause or something? So it's something beyond reasonable doubt. Yeah. Beyond reasonable doubt. So no, no, no. The other one, um, you know. So it's a flag to say that maybe there's something there, but it's not to take it as it has definitely detected this. Um, you know. So and I wouldn't. I mean, and and it's just going to be an arms race. So kind of you know zero zero GPT can kind of say, well, it found this, but then the other generations will go and kind of do something so it can't be detected. Like, so it's just, you know, it's a cat and mouse game. It's an arms race that um, we're not going to win anytime soon. OK, I think we have I would just caution as well. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was just going to caution as well. It will cause complacency. People will say, oh, turn it in, it'll catch it. No, it won't, because as everybody said, it's not reliable. We don't know what it's going to catch. We don't know what it's going to say. We have no control over that. and. That's a big thing that I think complacency is going to be the biggest issue. If we bring in that and say that Turnitin can detect this, then 
people are going to use it and use it without impunity as as Ian put there in the chat you know they're they're going to misanalyze misanalyze it thanks yeah and I sorry mean, just to bring out what what um, Orna said there like really it's in the design you know if if we're waiting to get to the when they're submitted and detecting then you know it's it's too late in the game yeah. OK, and it took, you know, probably took turn it in 10 years to develop its approach and, and for that technology and the, and all the structures and everything around it in terms of how to interpret the results. And even that, even now, there's lots of lots of debate about, you know, what it what it means. I think we've got time for one more question. And uh, uh, I'm not sure is it Ambrose Cohen or Cohen Ambrose, but um, anyway, uh, you know, points out that, you know, it's not just um, chat GPT that we're that we're confronting, but a whole raft of AI devices in, in video, in audio, and so on, and and points to well, what you know what learners and staff will need to learn about the imminent dangers and misuses of these technologies, like voice mimicry, and uh, love scamming, uh, whatever love. I know I think I know what love scamming is, uh, misinformation campaigns, fake news, and so on. How do yeah. How do you see any of these things uh, arising? Maybe Brian, from a student perspective, you know the the whole panoply of these things and and the the challenges. You know, what what do you see? You're muted there, Brian. Sorry. Yeah. Perfect. Um, yeah. I, it's a di a difficult one. Um, I don't think there is any easy answer there um all those kind of like the mimicry and all that kind of stuff has it's been it's been around for a while obviously with the attention that the new ais have gotten it's become more so especially with the likes of you know the love scamming and all that kind of stuff um i, I don't know it's just it'll be a hugely developing area um just that everyone will have to try and stay on guard for um yeah, I, I, I don't have an easy answer for that one. Yeah, I suppose, I mean, there's so many challenges for students, you know, in terms of we're, we're all familiar with mental health challenges that students have, and that's been a big a big topic recently, and, you know, things like spiking of drinks and so on. So you could see it falling into the, the sorts of, another thing that stu many students are young, not all students are young people, of course, but many students are young people, you know, been exposed to many of these things for the first time, perhaps, and it's maybe another another thing you know, but also the potential to use these things in student services to support students. So it will be interesting. Monica, you were wanting to come in there. Yeah, no, I, I think it's all about education. Um, so, so that people are, well, I, I don't want people to be hyper cynical, but, you know, to be looking at things and saying, huh, is that is that real or not? And it's all part of the this whole thing. I think it kind of moves assessment up the food chain. So it's not, sort of, you know, tell me the three reasons why X, Y, Z, but more as people have said before, the critical thinking thing, um, you know, reflecting or analysing things. So I think people need to be both, not just the students, but academics as well, because a lot of academics aren't, you know, on social media, mightn't know that there's all this mimicking going on, you know, and may, maybe they'd be Academics might be love scam too. Hi, this is Martin. Um, <laughs> but you know, like, so it's it's not just the students who need to be kind of aware. That the academics need. Well, just because we're academics doesn't mean that we automatically somehow know all this stuff. Um, we we don't. Um, so getting people to be to be aware of things, you know, and just the idea, you know, when you when we're team a bit searching, and then the ads that come up are related to the search that you that you put in, and just to make people more literate in that sense. You asked Greg earlier about digital literacy. I mean, it, it's a very broad term, but that's one of the elements that kind of encapsulates as well to be just don't believe, you know, what you see is what, what the reality. Yeah. So as you point out, you know, academics are humans too and, um, and are, are, are as open to these things. Uh, the last question, because I'm very conscious that we're really out of time, is uh, Jonathan Johnson asks a very important question there. I think, you know, we've just come out of uh, years of COVID and both staff and students, you know, in many ways are, are mentally, if not physically exhausted by, by change and having to adapt to change. And here we are again with yet another huge change. I mean, looking at it, do you think that we're well equipped now to, to confront um, the challenge of AI or what do we need? Is there anything we're going to need to change in our higher education systems? Maybe one thing to make us more resilient to this challenge. Maybe I'll go 
off what maybe Monica, if you, you know, one, <laughs> one thing that maybe we need to do, because we've just got a couple I, of minutes left. I, I'm just thinking in my head, just take the foot off the accelerator, but that, that that's not going to happen. Um, I suppose just kind of more understanding um, both, you know, from senior management that, you know, this is going to be challenging for staff, for students, that it's challenging for staff, for staff, that, you know, we have to you know, realise that, that students are, um, you know, under pressure as well. So I suppose, you know, a national conversation that, you know, students don't generally deliberately cheat. You know, they do, they take shortcuts, they're under pressure. There's kind of a, a variety of reasons. And sometimes you think, sometimes the effort they put into academic misconduct activities, think if they put that effort into actually doing it, they would have learned more. But I suppose, you know, I suppose just understanding and um, be, be kind. I know, I mean, somebody in computing talking being kind, you know, we're not meant to have any feelings at all, but maybe that, that might be one thing to put out there. Be kind, that's a nice, a nice message, I think. Brian, you had lots of suggestions at the early thing about things with higher education we could do, but now is there sort of one thing you think will make us more resilient to this? To this challenge better able to meet it yeah well obviously i i think assessment redesign and curriculum redesign is very important now obviously it's a huge thing to ask staff who are overworked that to to push that trying to find time and trying to find the balance because you know again lecturers and staff are human as much as students you know there has to be a kind of a balance between the two but i think there has to be a slow work between if without assessment reform and curriculum redesign, I think there is no way to be resilient against the changes that are happening. OK, thanks a million. Uh, Greg, you're next to my, my clockwise screen here. So what do you think is the key to resilience in this in this scenario? Well, you know what I've been doing very um, carefully doing of uh, well over the, the, the past three months is is using the AI to buy myself back some more time you know and not not letting it just autonomously make decisions for me um but gpt4 has been very good at prepping me and, and doing some tasks surely we should make the machine work for us rather than the other way around and this 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 means that it's buying us back some time buying us back some thinking time some space we're often very busy and active aren't we and um surely we we, we at least expect that from the technology that's not a positive way of looking at it. I think, you know, use it, use it. It's there. Use it to our to our advantage. And um, sometimes it takes a long time to learn how to use it. But then when you know how to use it, you save money. It's um, it's a bit yeah. like buying an electric car, isn't it? Yeah. And finally, Yvonne, um, you know, what do you think is going to be the key to becoming resilient in the face of, of this challenge? I think there's actually two things. Uh, one is reactive and one is supportive. The the supportive one is that we go back to basics. Why are we here? And it was Penny that put it in the chat there, as Phil Newton said earlier this week. Knowledge is essential learning as well. You know, well, you can't apply critical skills to anything if you don't know what the basics are. You know, as you said, if you can't drive the car, well, then you can't comment on what the roads are like, you know, for the car. Um, so you basically have to go back to what we do and why we are doing it. So we kind of have to go back a bit and look at our basics and look at what we actually want to achieve. But as we react in this reactive time, our first thing that we have to do is work together. And again, that came up in the chat there. We have to share the load. And I think we can do that as we work together because we're all facing this together. And we once we have a common approach, we can work forward on that and actually learn from each other. As Greg said there, great to know. Now I can save some time somewhere new documents mm. coming soon um, so basically you know we can use it as well and this is where we have to look at this as we work together and share that load i think thanks thanks very much Yvonne. i think that's a very positive note well we've come to the end of our our discussion i've left myself no time for a uh, drawing together which is great for me uh, i think you know we've all been saying it's a, it's a very complex issue um, i think collaboration is is the key as everyone has been saying and also in the in the chat and you know we're looking at changing the culture in higher education either bringing it back to where it should have been in the first place maybe as as brian was mentioning you know back to critical thinking and, and genuine learning or maybe to a completely new place you know as greg was almost suggesting that we're going to be co-working with these with these machines in the future, but whichever way, it's going to be a, an interesting, an interesting ride. 
Um, so just to say thank you to all of our, our colleagues um, from, from the National Academic, Academic Integrity Network, which has been a great forum for discussing these issues, I think, amongst other networks. And of course, internationally, there's other academic integrity networks operating, you know, at European level, at international level in Australia and so on, uh, which are a great um, support for everybody. And um, I've been, because I've been down this rabbit hole for about four months, I've been compiling, compiling um, resources on it. And there's a link to, to a, a sheet now. I think it's up to eight pages of resources on higher education and academic integrity in the chat. And of course, many other people have also compiled them. Anna Mills would be a, a good example of that. And uh, thanks to Billy Kelly uh, for keeping us all together in the National Academic Integrity Network and uh, to all the people at QQI and NAME for organising this excellent uh, webinar series this week. And of course, there's one tomorrow as well to wrap up the week. And thank you to all the people who attended today, well over 100 people, and for asking so many questions and making really good comments in the chat. And I hope everyone's found it productive. So um, thank you very much. Quiva, you've got a hand up there. Are you wanting to say something? Apologies, I was trying to do the react emoji to say well done. That oh, are you? Happen. Okay. Well, thanks, Cleva, for all your support in, in QQI for um, for making this, this webinar series happen as well. So good good morning again, good afternoon, or good evening, or good night to everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, Perry. Thanks, everyone.